I've hunted quite a bit when I was in my 20s, not so much now. The one that really stands out was when I was walking through unfamiliar woods, and I just got the feeling something was watching me. Like something was hunting me and not the other way around. I never saw anything. No tracks. No tufts of fur. Nothing to suspect an animal was hunting me, but I just couldn't shake the feeling. Only time I've ever been out in the woods and got that uneasy. I was hunting deer alone and shot a buck from much longer range than I should have. It looked like it was badly wounded, but it managed to run away. I gave chase, and for most of that, while he was out of my sight. After a mile or so of running, I caught sight of the buck a couple hundred feet away. The animal was not moving and had been finished off by another hunter. That person was at the buck's rear end and looked like he was humping it. I didn't even consider getting a closer look at that point. I might have had a legitimate claim to part of the buck's corpse, but claiming the meat was the last thing on my mind. I bolted out of there faster than I could have managed while chasing after it, praying the whole time he didn't notice me. As long as there's crazy deer, humpers in the woods, I'm not going back there. Our account is true, and this is what my husband and I saw, and what we experienced while on a belated honeymoon or Christmas getaway. And no, this did not deter us from the future plans we were making to move to this part of the country at all. Not even a little bit. Actually, it gave us even more of a reason to relocate and live here, as you will soon understand. My husband and I were orphans. It was crazy to meet someone like him who was, well, like me, from an adopted home. We met at school after my parents relocated to the Bay Area. Come to find out a week later, we would also attend the same church. Yes, my parents are my loving, awesome parents. And they have raised a pretty well-rounded daughter, I believe. Did great in school, leads a home Bible study to this day, and ended up with a degree in marketing. My husband ended up in a very loving home as well. His parents were also believers who loved him and gave him every advantage some orphan children never get to experience. So because of that, he became an organizer for a large Christian outreach program for orphan children around the world. It keeps him at home, but from time to time, it does have to leave for a few days or so at a time. Thus the reason for a belated honeymoon. As I said, we both had a lot in common. Faith, fun, music, movies, and a love for the great outdoors. We loved the Pacific Northwest, especially. It was this love for the outdoors that led us to an unexpected run. And with this animal or creature called Bigfoot, it was Christmas time nearly a decade ago. We had been married almost a year at that time. We opted for a December wedding because we were winter freaks, I suppose, and I did not want to wait any longer. Besides, Christmas and anniversaries sounded great together. He had to be gone for a few days right after our wedding, so we promised each other a belated honeymoon and a Christmas in the Pacific Northwest, preferably Oregon, Central Oregon. That brings me to our encounter, something rather frightening but interesting, all at the same time. And yes, it gave us a Christmas and belated honeymoon we will never forget. Central Oregon it was, Lake Odell to be exact, our one-year anniversary, and the honeymoon we missed, and Christmas that year would be spent there. Our parents would meet us up there right before Christmas Eve, but we would be there for a whole week before, and in the few days after Christmas. We wanted at least ten days of just enjoying each other in God's green earth together. Well, it turned out to be a white earth with all the snow. That was fine by us. As a matter of fact, we were into sledding and even cross-country skiing. So with everything packed, including skies, we set off for a long drive. What I do know for a fact was that this thing was slightly bent down to look through the window itself. 
It took us hours upon hours to get there, but by nightfall we made it all safe and sound. I have to say, it was even more beautiful than I expected. Even as the sun was almost gone and I could only see so far, I could make the outline of the surrounding mountains, the lake that looked to have frozen edges, and some lights from a couple cabins that must be in use nearby. There were not a lot of cabin lights, I noticed, just a couple from what I could tell, but then again there were so many trees everywhere, so who could tell if there were more anyway. Our cabin was just out of sight of the lodge, yet within the sheltered cove section. Within a couple minutes, we made it to the cabin. We were exhausted and decided to just unpack real quick and turn in for the night. Of course, we could not sleep just yet, so we grabbed some hot tea and enjoyed the warmth of the fireplace. The first night was quiet and uneventful. It was not until the next day that some odd occurrences and weird things would be noticed and experienced. I was up first the next morning. I grabbed a few things we forgot out of the car, got the skies off the rack, and leaned them up against the cabin on the front porch area. I decided to take a quick walk with a hot cup of coffee down by the edge of the lake, about fifty feet from the cabin. As I came to the edge of the lake, I noticed I was correct. The lake was frozen to about twenty or so feet out from the shoreline. I also noticed I was not the only visitor to this part of the lake. I noticed footprints. At first, it took me a few seconds to grasp what I was looking at. I even pulled my head up and looked around. I remember wondering who in the world is running around this place barefoot. It was around 30 degrees out that morning. I remember clear skies, but 30 degrees? I did not notice if they were overly large at the time or not. All I could really make out was the front half of each foot. Trust me, it was frozen solid down by the lake. Any impression at all would have to be from someone or something very heavy. That was the weird part at the time that made me think for a minute. I looked around at my surroundings a bit and then back down at the footprints that led along the edge of the lake towards the lodge, thinking. It was a little odd, I thought, but that was it. I just thought it was odd. I told my husband over breakfast, and he, like me, agreed there must be one, not so smart cookie up here this week. The rest of the day was spent having fun, of course. It was midweek, so the crowd was sparse at best, which was fine by us. I have to say, the couple running the resort were awesome folks. We had told them about this being our belated honeymoon and our real first Christmas together. With that, they brought us a Christmas tree and some ornaments for it. It was a sweet gesture we took full advantage of that second night. We trimmed the tree, ate dinner, and decided to take a walk down by the lake right before dark. We walked along the shore away from the lodge in a northeasterly direction. It was then that we thought we heard a whistle coming from the woods above us. It whistled a second time, and you could not mistake it. Someone was whistling in the woods. My husband thought nothing of it, only mentioning it was probably just a person passing by. As we walked, the whistles kept coming, not constantly, but every few minutes or so. Back in the cabin once again, we turned in for the night. The next morning, as usual, I was up before my husband, not wasting one minute up there. I filled up my coffee cup and headed out the door for a walk along the lake while my husband slept. As I barely got past where we parked the car, I noticed footprints in the snow again. This time I knew they were fresh. I was out here yesterday and would have noticed them. These, however, were rather large, I noticed, and the length between them, the stride, was rather long. I would wait until my husband woke up to show him, and I continued with my walk. This time, that morning, I did feel a little off while on my walk. I felt like I was being watched. My husband, being the sweetheart he is, called over to the lodge to let them know what we found. It was a husband and wife team by chance that ran the place back then, and the husband came over to check it out. He joked about it, but he did mention Bigfoot. We all laughed at it, of course, but he did say that there had, over time, been reports of sightings of the creature around the area. But he reassured us he had never seen one and personally did not believe they even existed. 
To this day, I believe he was telling us the truth. I think he never heard anything or noticed anything while he and they were there. We all shook it off to be somebody messing around, but who it was could not be anyone staying there at the time. The other couples were older folks for the most part. Either way, he said he would keep an extra eye out and that we should too. It was my husband who woke me up in the middle of the night two days later. He was wide-eyed and fully awake. No, he was not frightened or scared at all. But he was fully alert and dragged me out of bed and over to the window in the kitchen. He propped open the window just a bit. The cold night breeze almost hurt, to tell you the truth. But he insisted I stand still and listen. Howling, but not a dog type of howl. More like a deep, almost screaming howl coming from the mountains behind the cabin. Later, a month later, listening to some recordings I would find online. I can honestly tell you it was a Bigfoot howling that night, besides and not just because we would see it. The sounds were freaky and in a weird, chilling kind of way. After a few minutes and at the behest of me to shut the window, my husband reluctantly did so. We chatted again for a bit about it before we both fell back to sleep. Mine and my husband's parents would be there in just a few days to spend the last four days with us. Of course, they would all be in the cabin next to us. Well, not right next to us. It was about 40, 50 feet away from ours. The footprints and now the howling were making me feel a little uncomfortable. Not for my safety or anything like that, really, looking back now, I do. But then it was just feeling uncomfortable with my parents being there to experience these weird little things. At that time, we were about to spring it on our folks that we would, within a year, be moving to Central Oregon. I wanted nothing to make them feel any more worried about, including Bigfoot. Well, as far-fetched as Bigfoot seemed to me at that moment, it could be a little bit of an issue. The rest of that day, I decided to let it go. I put Bigfoot out of my mind and started focusing on getting things ready and getting some skiing in with my husband. There were no more weird feelings of being watched or howling for a night or two after that night. However, the footprints were still being found all over the place, and some came pretty close to the cabin, our cabin. The parents would be there the next day. The day after my husband, I realized how real these things, this Bigfoot species, are. Christmas Eve, Eve. It was the weekend, and we decided to get some cross, country skiing in. It was a clear day, the snow had stopped, and clear skies were to be the weather pattern for the next few days to come. No creepy feelings came that day, I remember, but then again, there were a lot of people enjoying the snow that whole weekend, especially the last day of the weekend. Like many animals, maybe being a little fearful and weary of humans, runs deep with this species as well. Some of the stories I hear seem to fly in the face of that belief, but when you see these things and know they are there, well, I think they would rather not be involved with people, for the most part at least. But back to the day. It was great, all of it. I was having a great Christmas vacation and honeymoon and telling you the truth. A part of me was a little thrilled with the footprints and howling going on. It made it just that much more exciting to a point. However, excitement would turn into less excitement and more of a cautious interest and massive shock at first, too. We had eaten dinner. I made some cookies earlier for dessert and some hot cocoa with peppermint. I always add peppermint to my cocoa. We were wrapping gifts for our parents when I noticed some movement near the kitchen window. Mind you, the kitchen window was rather high off the ground, larger than you expect for a rental cabin in the woods. Whatever it was, I could not see the street light down the way toward the lodge I could usually see through the window. Whatever it was was blocking it. As I looked out the window, it only took seconds. And then all of a sudden, well, I felt a sense of shock go right through me. I grabbed my husband's arm tightly, I remember. He even made a sound it was so hard. He followed my gaze at that moment out the kitchen window. I have seen films of Bigfoot since then, and I have to say, 
There was a film of one walking through the forest in the Sierra, I believe, by a forest service guy. That was it, except I could see the face and the upper torso. Well, I think most of the upper torso. What I do know for a fact is that this thing was slightly bent down to look through the window itself. Its face was not human, but it did have a human likeness to it. The report of an ape-like nose I can understand, however. It was not smashed down like a great ape. You could see a sort of rounded nose that was longer than it was smashed. The face was long and the eyes were huge, but had a ton of wrinkles around them. Between the red eye shine and the wrinkles, that is what made this thing look truly scary. Its mouth was huge, and I could even see some of the teeth between the large lips. The skin was dark gray, not gray, but a darker gray, like a real dark stormy sky before a bad storm. It had no ears sticking out, and the hair seemed to be a dark brown, at least it looked like it. The eyes were huge. It just looked scary. There was little hair between the nose and lower forehead area. We got a good look at this thing. It was wrinkly, too. Very wrinkly. It looked at us as though it was curious, but frustrated all at the same time. Or perhaps it was just frustrated and wanted to eat us, I don't know. I don't think anyone is in the heads of these things yet. It blinked once, then turned and walked off. We immediately jumped up, locked the front door, and shut off the lights. We had no gun at the time, so we were rather frightened for our own safety because of that fact. We stood there for about another three, four minutes, just staring out the window, talking about what we saw. While in the middle of talking, or whispering more like it, that creature, that Bigfoot thing came back into view, except closer to the tree line about thirty yards from the cabin. It was tall, but compared to me... Anything was tall compared to me, though, as I am all of five foot six. But this thing, well, it had to be at least eight feet tall. My husband, the next morning, would say at around seven, seven, one or two feet tall, when he compared it to the tree it was next to. It was standing near a large pine tree, a Douglas fir, if I remember correctly. It was visible because of the street light near the lodge casting a backlight on it. I could not make out the face anymore, but it was tall, had long arms, and seemed to have a slight bend at the hips as it walked away. It had a funny-looking gait. When people say it steps one foot in front of the other, it does, and I don't think it can help the way the shape of the body looked. Hopefully, those of you who have seen this thing can understand what I mean. We immediately called over to the lodge, waking up the managers. The husband came out on a ski machine about 20 minutes later, and he too was surprised at the footprints, their shape, size, and the fact that they looked close to human footprints. However, he noticed that the big toe was off too far to the side to be human, unless the human happened to be a giant person with deformed feet. While we wanted to laugh at the comment to keep our spirits up, we all just looked around and parted ways quickly heading back inside. It was late. It was just after midnight by that point, and the parents would be there that day. While we eventually did fall asleep, it was not until after a cup of tea and some time to process what we had seen. In the meadow, we built an abominable snowman. Scary, but with all the people out and about up here during the holiday week, I felt more, well, lucky to have seen what I saw the night before, than anything. However, I was still a little freaked out. I guess I felt that way because I was in what I felt to be a safer environment at the time. Some people are not when they have an encounter. We kept close to the resort as we walked around a bit that next day, but most of the time was spent getting things ready for the parents' arrival. Of course, a bit after they arrived, we told our parents what we experienced that night over dinner, and they did believe us. So much so that my mom wandered around a little nervous, I could tell the next few days. We also told them that we were relocating to Central Oregon, to the Bend area to be exact. They were a little sad at the news, but they joked that I could do some research on the ape-like creature we saw in our cabin window. 
I am a part of a local Bigfoot research team today, not the popular one you hear about, just a local organization. And as I said above, we are still searching and still seeking evidence. We did move to Bend, and yes, while out enjoying the wilds of Central Oregon, my husband and our new little addition, our son, we still wonder about and look for more evidence of the Bigfoot we saw at Odell Lake that Christmas. When I was 17 in 1983, me and four friends were driving on River Road to the Elkridge Drive. And on moving night, which is the day before Halloween, dark night. The road is very winding along the Patapsco River. I was in the back seat when I saw a glow through the woods. I said, what is that? We all looked and kept driving, not knowing that the road was taking us to it. As we got around a few more bends, the glow was right in front of us. Rich slowed to about five miles per hour. You can't go over 20 miles per hour due to narrow bends, someone yelled. Put the windows up. All tough guys a minute. A goal, L-O-L. We got right to her, floating on the side of the road in a gown or prom dress. I yelled, look, she's floating. My friend in front yelled, her eyes, she doesn't have any eyes. My hair stands up telling this. Everyone yelled, go, go, he sped the car up. My cousin looked at me and said, look behind us, see if she is still there. I said, no, because I could see her in the corner of my eye. She was floating right at the back of the car, around every sharp turn. It's like an inner voice told me. If I look back at her, we will crash into one of the trees. On a high embankment, I think he saw her, too. That's why he didn't turn around, either. No one in the car did. Her story is a long time ago. She and her boyfriend were on their way to prom. They argued. She got out of the car and laid down on the road, blocking him from going, when a car sped around the bend and ran over top of her. The pressure blew her eyes out of her head. I'll never forget the blackness of her sockets as she floated on the side of the road, right at that same bend in the road. My one friend who was up front would never talk about it. If one of us brought it up, he would get mad and go home. He was that scared. That's how we found out, talking in a bar, when an old guy asked, You guys talking about the prom girl on River Road? Yeah, I saw her too on Halloween. I almost fell down because we never said what night it was that we saw. Her and we saw her the night before Halloween. Then he told us that other ghosts were on that road. A man hung himself from a tree over the lake or swamp and a car crash killed a group of young people speeding around a bend. That's when we all looked at each other, and I had to sit down thinking, I wonder if they saw her too, sped off and turned to look at her again, like my inner voice said not to or else, and they crashed. Scary. I'm from South Florida, and my mom, her brother, and two uncles swear by this story. One of my uncles doesn't even like talking about it, so here it goes. My mom was a freshman in high school and living in Jupiter Farms, Florida. My grandma had to work that day and ask her two brothers to come to watch my mom and uncle. My uncle was about four years younger and had Down syndrome, so the extra help was needed. For dinner, my mom's uncles were grilling on the porch when they heard a horrible noise in the distance. They were never able to describe this noise other than saying it was not human and not animal. My mom had two dogs who immediately took off barking and running in the direction of the sound. A few seconds later, they were running back to my mom's house in fear. My mom said everyone looked in the direction the dogs had just come from and saw this massive being coming from the woods. They said it was about seven feet tall and as wide as a door frame. They immediately went inside and locked all of the doors, grabbed the guns, turned the lights off, and sat together in the living room. My uncle, who has Down syndrome, was visibly shaken and upset. My mom went to get a board game from her room to help calm him down, and 
While she was in her room, she decided to peek out of her window to see if the creature was still there. She says that when opened the window, the creature was standing directly in front of the window, staring in. My mom says she screamed bloody murder, and my uncles came running in and were frozen in shock or fear. One of them yanked my mom by the arm, and they slammed the door behind them and huddled in the living room. My grandma came home from work a few hours later to them, all crouching together in the living room. It's been over 20 years since this happened, and my mom and her uncles swear by this story. My mom says to this day that she'll never forget the face of Bigfoot and will get really upset when people tell her she's lying. She says she knows it's crazy and she didn't believe in it either, but she saw it and there's no denying that. One time my dad was dropping my mom off at home after a date and as they were talking outside her house, a row of trees began shaking violently as if someone was tearing them down. My mom immediately ran inside, and my dad took off to his car. Morris County, New Jersey. In early 2022, my friends and I were sitting in my car. The three of us had decided to pull over and chat, as it was late on a weeknight. And we had nothing to do but eat our Wendy's and enjoy each other's company. It's important to note that my car was not on, my lights were not on, and my radio was not on, nor were any of the windows open. Suddenly a deer appeared, almost out of thin air. I'd been looking in that direction the entire time, and the pond the deer appeared next to was very well lit. My immediate thought upon seeing the deer was Skinwalker. Get out! Of course it might not have even been one, but... Even just seeing the deer, I panicked. I had never been afraid of deer before, and before this moment, associated them with cherished moments I spent with my grandpa during childhood. I turned to my friends and told them, There's a deer. I think it's coming towards us. I said this before it even began to approach the car. The strange thing was, there was no reason for the deer to approach us at all. As I said earlier, we were not a disturbance, and the deer we spotted was alone. More importantly, it was a male deer with no females or babies within eyesight that it would need to protect. The deer walked about 20 to 30 feet and stood about 10 feet from my vehicle. At this point, my friends were spooked too. I noticed the deer had one missing antler, and its eyes were odd and different. The eyes were forward set on its head and looking directly at us. It looked directly at me for around 30 seconds and got into a charging position. When we tried to drive away, it started charging at my car and even chased us until the parking lot ended and became the road. The strangest part was as we drove away. Much farther down the road, there were three male deer standing just behind the curb in a domino-like formation. The third one in the sequence was missing the same antler as the deer we encountered earlier. They did not run into the street or off into the woods. They just stood there staring us down. I wonder if something was keeping them in that park. I grew up on an acreage in a rough bush area in northern British Columbia. We worked really hard and were often in close proximity to all kinds of wildlife. I got my first rifle when I was nine years old and hunted from that point on until recently. This happened to me 50 years ago when I was 14. I was in the habit of jumping on my motorbike riding 20 miles further back from the head of the road where we lived into the bush on old logging roads and then hiking 45 minutes through dense bush to my favorite fishing spot, Brewster Lake. I would like to go alone with just my dog. He always knew where I was going and would trot his way out by himself, usually showing up about 30 minutes after I got there. We would usually spend two or three days there when we went. I didn't pack a lot of gear. My twenty-two hunting knife, sleeping bag, matches, fishing gear, frying pan, and sometimes I would even remember to bring the salt and pepper since I never, ever brought food in with me. Either I'd head back home and I couldn't stomach any more fish, or if it was too wet, as I also never had a tent. 
I just slept under the stars of my sleeping bag. I had never even heard of Bigfoot. On this particular trip, it was in late August 1973, as mentioned, I didn't have a tent, just my dog and I. During my second night sleeping out under the stars at around 2 to 3 a.m., I woke to the sound of something very large moving through the woods on two legs about 25 or 30 feet off to my right on the edge of the brush. I couldn't see anything because my fire was long out and it was overcast. I glanced around to see where my dog was. He was usually nearby me but was nowhere to be seen. My twenty-two was just off to my left, and I had my hunting knife beside me inside the sleeping bag. I didn't think the uh, twenty-two was going to be much help in the event of a big animal attack anyhow, so I left it where it was and slipped my knife out of its sheath inside my sleeping bag. I thought it must be a bear, because what else could it be? I lay still hoping that whatever it was would leave me alone and move on, but that wasn't in the cards. I was camping on a small rocky point between the ledge of the brush and the lake. It's about 30 feet wide. I was about in the middle between the lake edge and the bush. My feet were pointed mostly toward the lake at an angle with my head facing mostly toward the woods. I heard this thing moving around to the back of me. It came out of the brush and slowly moved up directly behind my head. As this was happening, I was preparing for the fight I thought was surely coming. So in my sleeping bag, I slowly shrugged my shoulders up as close to my ears as possible and moved my left hand and arm up over my throat to protect my neck. My right hand was on my chest with my knife tightly gripped and ready to go if something was going to eat me for lunch. It might be a cheap lunch, but I was going to make sure it wasn't going to be a free lunch. I was sleeping with my head mostly covered by the top of my sleeping bag with just my eyes, nose, and mouth exposed to the night because of all the mosquitoes. Even though I was on mostly rock, I could feel the footsteps. I've never heard anything breathe so loudly. If you breathed in and out as long and hard as you could in an exaggerated way, it still wouldn't even come close. I swear, I could feel the breath. I tell you, I was fully expecting... I was going to get my face chomped. I remember thinking to myself, what the hell kind of bear is this? It stopped about three feet behind my head, and that's when the smell hit me. I mean, it was bad. I can't even describe it. And in spite of my best intentions to be quiet, lay still, and hope it didn't mess with me, I couldn't help gagging and coughing. Now this part is very hard to explain, and I don't give a crap if people believe me or not, but at that point, I clearly heard a calm voice in my head, telling me that I had nothing to worry about. I was perfectly safe, and nothing was going to hurt me. I should relax and go back to sleep, and right then I was overcome with a sense of calm and feeling, extremely tired. I remember thinking to myself, what the hell, how can I go to sleep at a time like this? My visitor turned and started walking away from me, and I fell right to sleep before it was even gone. I don't remember it leaving. I slept well and woke up at first light about 6 a.m. to a cow moose up to its mid-belly in the water, feeding on the lake bottom, not 25 feet from where I was laying. And my dog was back beside me. This messed with my head for a long time because it was not at all like a bear. It was definitely walking on two legs, and the odor was unlike anything I've ever smelled. I couldn't make sense of it. I never talked to anyone about this until years later when I told my grown sons. I don't know that they believed me, and I can't say I blamed them, but at least they had the good sense to keep that to themselves. I'm from the era when if someone said they didn't believe you, that's the same as them calling you a liar and... Those are fighting with words. In spite of that, the experience never deterred me in the least from going back out and camping alone in the same area. This whole thing started about 10 years ago in 2010. I was in the Navy at the time and stationed in Connecticut. The naval base I was stationed at had been built during World War II as a submarine base to combat German U-boats. 
In the 50s, it was retrofitted with Cold War-era bomb bunkers and underground tunnels that had been sealed off in the 90s after decades of disuse and maintenance neglect. Of course, they were always the horror stories of that one seaman who stupidly wandered into the tunnels and got lost, never to be heard from again. Cue the X-Files theme, but these were just campfire stories. However, on this particular base was a building named for Admiral English. This building was reputed to be majorly haunted. The night watchman would see people in the building after it had been closed for the night, and when they tried to pursue those people, the watchman would turn a corner to a dead end and find no one there. When the roving watch would check doors to secure areas that were meant to be locked, only to find them unlocked, they'd call down their superiors to file a report on the door, only for it to be locked. You'd be in the middle of your roving patrol, and the, all the lights in the building would turn off. And on one specific occasion, the stationary watchman at the door went a little wonky. He logged the long-dead Admiral English as being in the building in the official logbook. He then turned to the painting of Admiral English that was hung on the quarterdeck and gouged the eyes of the painting out. He later claimed he did this because the painting wouldn't stop watching and whispering at him. He also logged in and out of the building various famous figures like Santa Elvis, Vincent Price, and the Beatles. After testifying at Captain's Mass that the painting was trying to talk to him, he was sent to mental health and deemed unfit to serve in the military, given a Section 8 and sent home. I stood the night watch in that building a short while after the painting had been removed for repairs. Me and my watchmate heard people moving around the building a number of times, but any time I went to investigate, there was no one. I was supposed to be continuously roving, and every time I came the stairwell, I'd have to turn the lights back on. At one point, the elevator in the building started itself for seemingly no reason. Fortunately, I didn't see anything. At least that night, I didn't. A couple weeks later, I was walking up an outdoor staircase on the base that connected the lower base to the upper base. This particular staircase was very long. Think man pyramid long. There were no turnoffs for this staircase once you were on it. Then you were on it until you reached the top or the bottom. On one side of the staircase was an empty field of grass that sloped down a wheel. You could see from the top to the bottom of, and on the other was a three-four-foot partitioning wall with a two-foot-tall double railing on top of it. And beyond this partition was evergreen bushes growing so close together. They basically formed an impenetrable hedge. So there was nowhere to go that way, and you could easily be seen going the other. I was walking with a friend toward the galley up the stairs, and in front of us a short ways up the stars was either a chief or an officer. We weren't really sure as we were seeing them from behind, and they wear a similar cocky uniform. Except the particular person's uniform was odd. It looked old. Not worn, not old, but more like the way uniforms look back in the way uniforms look back in the VOW days. I turned to my friend to comment on this and glanced at me and agreed, asking if maybe he was headed to some event that required an older uniform. We glanced back toward him, and he was just gone. From the halfway point up the staircase, he'd vanished. The only place he could have been hiding was in the bushes, but we'd have seen him climbing the dividing wall if he had. I'm sure of it, and why would he do so in the first place? That was the first time I saw something. Over the coming weeks, I began to notice weird little things. Things that could be put down to absent-mindedness at first. Like I'd find my keys moved from my desk to a shelf where I kept movies and have no recollection of putting them there. Then other things would happen. I'd be watching a movie when suddenly my TV would turn off. I assumed there was a timer I accidentally managed to turn on, but I couldn't find anything in the menu or manual about that. At one point I headed to the vending machines in the lobby for a late night snack, leaving my door ajar, only to come back and find my door locked with a key card inside my barracks room. I assumed I messed up and accidentally pulled the door shut instead of leaving it open, so I accepted the lecture I got from my superior for locking myself out, only for him to discover the door was ajar. So he gave me a random inspection instead. 
At another point, the key card to my door stopped reading. I went to get it recharged, and they found that it had been completely wiped of all data, and they had to issue me a new one along with a warning to keep it away from magnets. I didn't have any magnets. A wristwatch I'd gotten for my birthday disappeared for three days. And then one day I opened my wardrobe, and there it was, front and center directly in my line of sight. On top of all the general weirdness, I felt like I kept seeing things out of the corner of my eye, but when I looked, there would be nothing there. At the time, I just assumed I was stressed and imagining things and that I needed a vacation. Luckily, I was on my way out of the Navy. I moved back home to the old farmhouse my great-grandfather had built. The first night I was there, I went to bed at my usual time of around 11 p.m., only to jolt awake from a deep sleep at around 2 a.m., and suddenly be wide awake and not able to get back to sleep until near 5. This quickly became a regular occurrence, unfortunately, so much so that I started to play video games or surf the web for a couple hours whenever I'd suddenly wake up at 2 a.m., and then this weird reoccurring dream started. In the dream, I'm living in some old Victorian-style plantation home with a wife and two kids. I'm walking through the back gate, where I see my kids playing in the backyard. I walk into the back door into the plantation-style kitchen that's been modernized. I walk into a laundry or pantry room off the kitchen and look out the back window at my kids, only to see a third kid, a girl in turn-of-the-century dress walking toward the kitchen door, and as I watch, she disappears. I go to find my wife, who seems to be upstairs somewhere. I call up the stairs at her, but get no response. I turn back toward the kitchen, and there, less than two inches from my face, is the face is the face of the ghost girl. I startle and scream, backing away from her until I find myself cornered on an old table in the wall. The girl stares at me as she approaches, getting right in my face. I try to look away in shame as this overwhelming sense of guilt washes over me. Then she opens her mouth to speak, and as I look toward her to hear what she has to say, I wake up. Every time. I've had this dream many times in the preceding years, and I've never actually heard what she has to say. So I'm having this weird dream, and I'm waking up in the dead of night. And I mean from a sleep so deep the dead would be jealous to not even groggy awake in an instant. And I'm still experiencing the shadows. As well, I've started experiencing this weird thing where I'll be playing video games and I'll feel this human presence behind me watching and occasionally, I swear, I could hear breathing. But then when I turned to look, nothing I assumed I was just having some sort of emotional trouble acclimating to civilian life again, but that's when I started to find bruises and scratches. I don't know how I got. I'd wake up, and there's be a massive bruise on my forearm that wasn't there when I went to sleep, and little things were going missing. My tools were disappearing. I somehow went through four pair of sunglasses in less than a month. My expensive canvas paint brushes started to vanish, and I had to replace my house keys twice in that same month. I went to a doctor, told him I was having bouts of sleeplessness, kept losing things, nightmares and waking up covered in bruises and scratches. He told me I was developing maintenance insomnia, likely due to the stress of not being in the military anymore, and suggested I turn my alarm clock away from me and walk more. These things help, but not much and he couldn't explain the random injuries, so not a lot of help. Then one night, I just couldn't seem to stay awake, so I hit the rack at like nine at night, woke up at 1 a.m. to the smell of smoke. I opened the door to my bedroom, only to be met with a wall of smoke and an orange haze. I quickly covered my mouth and started finding my way out of the house. I made my way to the nearest exit, and when I turned around, I could see the entire front room of the house was completely engulfed in flames. The fire inspector came out and couldn't find any natural means of the fire starting and so suspected arson, but they also couldn't find an artificial ignition point either. It just seemed to have happened. Started from nothing and just happened from nothing. There was also a bunch of weird stuff about the fire. 
The fire burned so hot it melted a fireproof safe, but then my art portfolio was untouched. My TV and Xbox were melted beyond recognition, but the Bible my father gave me for my 18th birthday was fine. It was truly bizarre. After that, I moved into town with my parents. They were living in this little house, and it was weird because the house was full of windows and well light, but somehow still seemed full of shadows. Something my mother noticed. We sat down one day and discussed how we both kept seeing shadows moving in our peripheral vision. She told me that since I moved in, she kept finding her wedding ring in weird places. She would leave it on her bedside table only to find it in the dining room, for example. There were other weird things, too, like my folks would leave for the night and I'd be in my room on my computer and start hearing doors slamming closed, only to investigate the noise and find nothing but open doors, even the doors that were usually closed, such as in parents' door or the door to the laundry room. These events kept happening and getting worse. At one point, I was chatting with a Navy friend, only to hear all this banging and absolute ruckus from the kitchen thinking my parents' dog was into something I went to clean up his mess, only to find that he was cowering behind my dad's armchair and every pot and pan in the house to scattered across the kitchen floor. In another instance, M folks were out and M brother came over to watch Monday night football. We were sitting there talking about how the Lions were never going to make it to the Super Bowl if Stafford didn't learn to perform under pressure. I had the dog sleeping on the couch next to me, and my brother was in my dad's chair. He got up to get a beer from the fridge and made it around the east side of the couch when we heard a huge bang, like a bomb going off from upstairs. We went rushing up there only to discover what few personal items I had left after the fire had been thrown around the room. Google had been pulled upon my laptop and a bunch of random characters had been typed into the search bar, and my mattress and bedding looked like it had been chucked across the room in a fit of rage. And this is when I started to think it could actually be a haunting. There were other witnesses now, and there were other witnesses now, and there's no way I forgot that I ransacked my own bedroom. I wasn't imagining things or hearing things. This was happening somehow. A couple days later, I fell asleep reading up on ghosts, hauntings, and common occurrences that happened during a haunting. I woke in the middle of the night and turned toward my beside table to turn off the light, only to see an older woman in a high-color black Victorian-era dress standing at the foot of my bed. I stared at her for a moment and could only think to ask, Who are you? She just shushed me in response. At that point, I was overwhelmed by a sense of well-being and contentedness, like being wrapped in a warm hug, and I got the impression I should just go back to sleep. So I laid back down, noticed that the old lady seemed to be floating as it didn't look like she had any legs, and started to fall back to sleep. All of a sudden, the reality of what I was seeing hit me, and I bolted up in bed, and the room was empty. To this day, I don't know if that was real, a dream, or what. But I can tell you this, I didn't sleep a wink more that night, and I started to question my own sanity. Shortly after, my parents asked if I could stay living with them as they found it useful to have me around doing some of the chores they were simply getting too old to do, such as shoveling snow from the walkway. I agreed, and so it was decided we needed a bigger space to live. Things settled down significantly at the new house. Though I was still having the insomnia, the dream about the ghost girl waking up with minor injuries out of nowhere, that at this point became so commonplace I started wearing hoodies everywhere to hide them, and there was one new thing. The furnace in the new house kept breaking down. We'd call in a repair guy who'd shut it down, look at it, find nothing wrong with it, and start it back up just to find it works perfectly. So that was odd. Unfortunately, the landlord mortgaged the house and wasn't paying the monthly installments, so it was foreclosed on. We moved to another house where the insomnia finally stopped, and while I still had the dream, I had it less, and the injuries lessened as well. There were a few instances where weird noises would be heard, or the dog would bark at a nothing in the hallway. The worst thing that happened there was every now and then I'd get a stomach cramp. It's last between 20 minutes to an hour at the most. 
This was weird because I hadn't changed my exercise routine at all, or my dietary habits, or any brands that I'd normally eat. And then one day it was my day off of work. Any of my girlfriend at the time was working. I was all caught up on my chores and had nothing to do. So I was playing God of War, Ascension, the trial of Archimedes, and I started to get another stomach cramp, except this one didn't go away like all the others. In fact, it lasted about a week. I finally broke down and went to the doctors, and they couldn't find a reason for it at all. I went home, struggled to fall asleep, and when I woke up, the pain was gone. The owner of the house we were living in at that point decided to retire from being a landlord and sell to my parents again, moved this time to a much smaller house where we noticed a lot more weird stuff. We kept finding doors open. We'd wake up in the morning to find the TV on. This one actually did have a timer in it, so even if we did forget to turn it off, it would turn itself off after about four hours. And we were still finding it on in the morning. The chairs around the dining room table we never actually used always seemed to be pulled out, and the light in the kitchen was always turning itself off when you were cooking, and you always seemed to have the feeling of being watched. Luckily, we didn't live there long, as along with the supernatural weirdness, we also lived in a bad neighborhood, and the constant flashing lights convinced my parents to just buy a house. At this point in 2017, I visited Europe for three months with my, at this point, fiancé, and nothing happened. No dreams, no bruises and scratches, no anything for those entire three months. It was awesome. While I was in Europe, my folks moved into their new house, and when I got back, I went to the new house. Nothing happened the entire time I was in that house, thankfully, and I began to hope that Whatever had been plaguing me for all those years, had finally got left behind somehow. My fiancé and I were married later that same year, and we decided to live in Europe, where my now wife owned an apartment that she had inherited from her recently deceased mother. We figured with no mortgage or rent payments, it'd be a nice head start. And that's when things started up again. I'll be sitting in the living room, and I'll see a shadow walk by the door to the room. At one point, the only ones home were me and our toddler. My wife was at the gym. My wife was at the gym. My wife's napping, and I was on Reddit when I saw the shadow walk across the door. I immediately thought, who is in the apartment, and got up to investigate, only to find no one. My wedding ring disappeared off my desk while I was in the shower one day. I never found it, and it never turned back up. I had to get a new one. Various rooms in the apartment constantly feel frigid, even in the height of summer, and those pesky doors keep slamming themselves closed, even if they weren't open to begin with. And to top it all off, I find myself discovering weird scratches I can't explain on my legs again. I've started having the dream about the ghost girl again, and to top it all off recently, I began having this weird thing where I can't seem to wake up. I'll go to be at ten. 30 at night and not be able to wake up until almost noon the next day. I sleep through my alarm, my wife's alarm, my toddler fussing through the baby monitor, and really anything, which has never been a problem before. At this point, I'm convinced that I somehow attracted something into my life that's been following me around for a decade, something that took the guise of the old-timey sailor, the turn-of-the-century ghost girl and the Victorian matriarch to prevent me from seeing its true self. The thought that horrifies me. If there's anybody out there who knows more about hauntings than I do, let me know what you think it is, how I could get rid of it, and what I should do to protect my loved ones. In the early 90s, when I was around 19, I worked night shifts unloading trucks at a retail department store in Oklahoma. This was before they transformed into superstores. One night, my co-worker, who had been garnering attention for her distressed appearance, opened up to us during a break. She revealed that she had started taking a longer route to work and back due to something she had witnessed. Previously, she used to travel a road called Moccasin Trail. 
However, the week before, she claimed to have seen a massive werewolf while turning onto that road on her way to work. This encounter had occurred on four or five occasions, and it had left her visibly shaken. She expressed fear that the creature might start following her. As a result, she decided to completely avoid that road altogether. According to her description, when she turned onto Moccasin Trail, her headlights illuminated the embankment across the road just enough for her to see a large werewolf sitting about 30 feet up on the embankment. It would be sitting in the grass with its legs stretched out in front, often leaning back and supporting itself on one or both of its elbows. It assumed a leisurely pose, seemingly watching the passing cars. Her account of the sighting conveyed a genuine sense of disturbance. Over the years, I've heard several stories about strange occurrences in that area. Local Native Americans even spoke of other shapeshifters in the vicinity. While I can't confirm a direct link between these stories and the werewolf sighting, it's worth mentioning the peculiar happenings reported by various individuals over time. This happened to me a few years ago, probably back in 2017 when I was 14. I still think about this encounter almost every day. My dad lives near a small lake in Wisconsin. There are only about a hundred people who live in the neighborhood. My brother and I spent every other weekend up there, so we knew pretty much everyone. My dad's house was the second house to the top of this large hill. At the very top is a gas station and the diner where I would work over the summer. At the bottom of the hill was a lake and a small beach. That morning I was waitressing at the diner and at the end of my shift I bought a slushy from the gas station and was planning on going down to the beach for the afternoon. Parked outside the diner was a gorgeous teal vintage car. I'm not sure what brand I'm not good with that stuff but it seemed to be from the 60s and it caught my eye. D was an older man in the driver's seat and his wife in the passenger seat. They had their windows up and I wasn't too close so I'd I didn't get a great look at them, but I did notice they were looking at me. I didn't think anything of it and started walking home. On my walk home, I remember wondering where they could be from. We don't get many tourists, and I would have remembered if someone drove a car like that. The diner was off of a pretty quiet highway, and it was rarely used by out-of-towners, but I assumed they were just driving through. My younger brother and I went to the beach that afternoon and hung out for a few hours. When we decided to head home, I packed up my stuff probably a minute before he did and started walking home before him. On the walk up the hill, there was probably half a city block's distance between us. He could clearly see me, but we were too far to talk. I heard a car coming towards me and looked back and moved to the side of the street. It's the car I saw earlier at the diner. They slow down as they approach me, and I start to get nervous. The woman in the passenger seat rolls down her window, and I nearly shit my pants. They both seem to be wearing hyper-realistic latex face masks. There seemed to be no beginning and no end to the mask. There weren't noticeable holes for eyes yet. Their eyes definitely seemed real, and there was no seam at the edge of the neck. If they were wearing masks, they were some of the best masks I've ever seen. It must have cost a fortune, but it definitely wasn't their skin. There's no way. Something about them was so off. The woman asked me for directions to a highway I've never heard of. I didn't drive yet, so this in itself wasn't weird, but I pointed them to the highway by the diner that leads out of town. They thanked me, rolled up the window, and drove away. I ran to my brother and told him what happened, and he said they looked pretty normal when they drove past him, but they looked normal to me that morning as well. The masks were too good. You had to be close enough to notice how strange they looked. There was just something so unsettling about them. They didn't really do anything odd except asking a girl who was clearly too young to drive for directions, but it was a very small community. I might have been the first person they had seen in hours. It was just the way they looked. I'd never seen anything like it, and I haven't seen anything like it since then. 
I mentioned it to my dad when I got home, but he didn't have much to say about it. I still feel deeply unnerved when I think about it. More than six years later, I don't believe in much of the paranormal stuff, and I do think they were human. But why the masks? What were they doing there? And why ask a child who is obviously too young to drive for directions to a highway? Has anyone ever experienced something like this before? Fall 2022, I spent the night at a friend's house in their second floor spare room before a road trip. We were aiming to be on the road at 4 a.m., and I had fallen asleep around 10 p.m. I was sober, for context, when I have to be up early for something important like a job interview, first day of work, flight, etc. I do not sleep well. I am prone to waking up at all hours, paranoid that I have somehow missed my alarm. So it wasn't unusual that I suddenly woke up and worriedly looked at my phone, thinking I overslept. I felt better after seeing the time, 2.31 a.m., and nestled back into bed. I was still alert for the next few minutes from the anxiety or adrenaline of being potentially late, and was trying to will myself back to sleep with my eyes shut. Then I felt the bed sink down by my feet. I was on my side in the fetal position facing away from the door. It felt like the weight of a person was sitting in the crook of my knees. I always thought I would keep a level head with a ghostly encounter because the idea has always excited me, but turns out I was terrified low. My heart started pounding and I kept my eyes closed because the hallway light was on and I did not want to see any kind of shadow. Not a damn thing. I stayed like that until I eventually drifted off to sleep. I also kept this experience to myself so I wouldn't freak my friend out or have her husband make fun of me until a few weeks later at her Oktoberfest party when I drunkenly spilled the beans thinking they would think it was a funny story. Immediately she shouted, I knew it, and ran to get sage and start smudging the house. She explained she sometimes heard work boots stomping around upstairs while she was working from home, but didn't want to believe it. We started laughing hysterically while she's saging, and her husband is rolling his eyes and laughing, and after we settle down, we go to bed like normal, me in the spare room. Nothing happened in the spare room that night. The next morning, over. Coffee, she mentioned that the man who built the house in the 50s died on the property, something like a heart attack while he was mowing the lawn, and that she would like to think he's just checking to make sure they're taking good care of it. She lives in another state, so I don't see her often, but I know they've started some construction, and I'm a little paranoid about what, if anything, will happen the next time I stay over. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.